What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 236. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me on the line, he's back, the Bwongoceros, Brian Wong. Marshall told me I, I, we only had time for one word about Journey Draft. So that word is minotaurs oh baby really? uh, you're teasing me we'll have to talk about that next week though because this week we're going to be talking conspiracy we got we were kind of overwhelmed with questions about if we were going to be doing a show on conspiracy which we were kind of in between on and then after getting a billion questions about it we both figured well let's we might as well do it yeah, I think people are excited for conspiracy, Marshall. That is that is the the messages that we received. I certainly got that same vibe. Now, before we dive into all that, let's talk a little bit about cardkingdom.com. Um, you know, if you want to buy conspiracy, I'm sure they'll have it and that seems like a fine fine idea to me to uh to pick it up. We're going to be diving a little bit deep on conspiracy, but considering that it isn't out at the time of this recording, we're going to try to keep things relatively high level. And I think that that's the proper approach to something like that. Um, but still, we're going to be talking about it, you know, for the good chunk of the show here. And uh, if it kind of gets you excited about about playing conspiracy, CardKingdom.com is a great place to go to find it. Um, we talk about a lot of things from week to week on the show. I like to bring up you know, the quick shipping, standing by their product, the fair prices, the things that, you know, really appeal to me. But there are a few other things that people have noted about Card Kingdom as well. Yes, we got this email from listener Michael, and he says, Hi, Marshall and Brian. I noticed that you tend to talk about the same reasons why Card Kingdom is a great site to buy from when you do your spot for them each episode. And I want to point out something that I don't think they get enough credit for. Their grading scale is serious business. I've purchased from a variety of sites which will all remain nameless. And one of the reasons that I'm a repeat customer for Card Kingdom is that when they say a card is near mint, it is near mint. A lot of other sites are much looser on their grading, which can be really disappointing when you order a handful of cards and they come with dents and grime and other things that will uh, still count in as near mint in someone else's book, but not mine. Card Kingdom has never disappointed me in this regard, and I'd like you to give them a shout-out for their dedication to quality in this regard. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, that's awesome. And so yeah. that's, you know, something that, you know, you might not consider, but it's that attention to detail. One of those one of those many reasons that we love cardkingdom.com and highly recommend that you check out their website the next time you need to make a magical purchase. Um okay, before we dive into conspiracy, I had a quick thing from last week's show. We had Rich Hagen on and first off, I want to say thank you so much for all the great feedback. He appreciates it, appreciates it and so do I. Uh it was great to hear uh, the the positive stuff about seeing a different side of Rich. And and also, I just appreciated you guys giving him a lot of credit for opening up like that. That's not easy to do what he did on that show. And uh, it really takes a lot to put yourself out there like that. It takes a lot of nerve and a lot of bravery. And he, he did that really well. And I thought it was great that you guys rewarded him for that by saying that you appreciated it. It's a big deal. Um, the other thing too, is that he wanted me to, to leave you a quick message, which was, he said, thanks for the feedback and that he's doing fine. You know, um, you know, he opened up about some things on that show that, uh, you know, were, were kind of private and, and a little bit worrisome to be honest. And, uh, and he said he's doing okay. Like he's working on it and, and he's okay. And also he wanted to let you guys know that he's looking forward to the next time that he gets to chat with you on limited resources. And I can assure you there will be a next time. So with that, uh, I also just wanted to personally say thanks again to Rich for, uh, for coming on and showing Brian how to do a real sign off. So I, uh... it had to sting, man. That thing was ridiculous. You know, he one shot at that. Yeah. Like there was well, no, like he had written down some of the notes so that he didn't miss stuff, but it's not like he was like, Oh, let's start over or edit that part out. He just went, he just oh, yeah. did it. I, I think he really got into the true spirit of the sign off, which, and one of, one of the things about sign offs is that they're one take, like only yeah. like catastrophic failure will result, will result in redoing the sign off. Cause a part of the fun of the sign off is seeing the reaction you get from the other person. So, yeah. you know, when you, when you redo it, you lose that. So I, I want to give him a lot of credit for just, just charging through it like that. That was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, he, he was telling me sort of what was going on with it and I'm like, no, just, just wait. Just let me know, and I'll just sit here and react to it or whatever, because yeah. that's how we do it. Okay. Deep breath. We are doing a show on Conspiracy this week, which is a unique and cool product that Wizards of the Coast is going to be 
uh, releasing shortly from the time of this recording. And we decided that the best approach to doing this was instead of doing a card by card set review, which is not possible at the moment, but also feels like overload for something like this. Uh, we decided to do it along the vein of our primers, right? Our, our, our shows that are a shorter version of a set review show that gets you a big picture view on what's going on in a format as opposed to getting into the nitty gritty, which is what we do for the new sets when they come out. Yeah, I also feel like if we did a card by card review, that just the fact that you're playing multiplayer um, is is going to change, you know, the evaluation process like so severely that that I I wouldn't feel confident in my ability to to grade out cards that way anyway. So I think we just kind of want to give you some stuff to think about. But you know, we're far from experts on this set, and you know, who knows if we'll ever be because uh, you know it's a pretty zany thing. It is. So why don't we start uh, with big picture? What is conspiracy? Well. It is an expansion of Magic the Gathering, but mm -hmm. in a weird way. Uh, I think the easiest way to describe conspiracy is let's say that you had some card designers for Magic and they were like, what if we made a set that was meant to be drafted but played multiplayer? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's sort of the, the, the core of what conspiracy is about. And I think if you take that idea of drafting multiplayer decks and then – Give it some license, right? Give it a little bit of room to work with, a little bit of rope, right? I mean, it's like um, most sets have to adhere to certain things. They have to have all these checklists or check boxes ticked by the time the set gets released. They have to be really careful that it doesn't screw up standard, but that the limited is still balanced and they don't break block. And, you know, there's all these crazy things that they have to check on. With something like this, they really kind of let their hair down <laughs> and let mm -hmm. it go. I mean, some of these cards are so crazy, they almost feel like unset-ish, right. you know, right. like not quite like denim walk, but like things that you just wouldn't be able to get away with in a set that was going to be, say, played at like the GP or the Pro Tour level. Um, and man, I got to say, just loosening the collar a little bit really makes for some cool stuff. Yeah, it, it reminds me of um, something that we used to do. Um, here in Seattle, but it's the the boo draft. The boo draft. We build our own, but in, in boo draft, you know, players would come up with kind of zany stuff that would affect the draft. Like actually, like while you're drafting, um, you know, cards are going to come up and change the way things are happening. Um, and this set is like chock full of those. So uh, it, it's just really fun to see some of the design space that they found by you know going in, into this like untapped mine. That's right. Now. Uh, in, in To talk numbers, there's 210 cards in Conspiracy. 65 of them are new. Uh, yeah, so the, a lot of reprints. A lot of reprints. Uh, and then 13 of which are Conspiracies, which is what we're thinking here. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are a new card type that we're going to be talking about. Now, the main idea here is you get eight people together. Yep. You draft. And then you split into two four-player games. Right. That's a huge – like everything that we say for the rest of this show is going to be affected by that, right? right. That's, that's kind of like a huge underlying thing that you have to know is that this was meant to be played multiplayer. Yes, absolutely. And you can tell that like all the cards, the reprints that they – seems like they're selecting and then uh, some of the new designs, it, it's, it's, it's all geared towards multiplayer. So you know, um, when – you know, all the stuff that we're going to be talking about is going to be multiplayer you know, for the rest of the show. So just, just um, keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that Brian and I don't play a lot of multiplayer. <laughs> right. And I think that's fine. You know, we kicked around the idea of like maybe having somebody come on that really knew multiplayer, but then that kind of makes the show a bit unwieldy. And I said, you know what? You're going to be able to find that, right? Like if you want to learn about the intricacies of multiplayer uh, stuff, you can find that on many different articles, podcasts, whatever. We're going to bring you the limited resources viewpoint on this set, which is that, hey, I'm a nuts and bolts spike. I don't really worry that much about multiplayer, so I'm going to approach it how I would approach it, and you guys can take from that what you will. Um, we, we may be learning along with you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's a pretty – it's a it, it's a – it's a set that definitely pushes boundaries. And as you see, uh, as we move forward and we talk about some cards specifically, you're going to see some boundaries pushed in some very weird directions. Now, 
Um, I, I have had a chance to play this set. Uh, I can't really talk about that, though. Uh, I can only talk about the stuff that's officially been released um, by Wizards. So we'll have to stick to that. But I have had a chance to play it. So I do have a pretty nice insight on it that others might not, at least at the time of this recording. And uh, I'm going to be able to use that at least when I can, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, for you who don't know, Marshall was in the one of the video promotions for Conspiracy, so you can see, you know, uh, you know, they they brought a bunch of hired guns in to to draft the set and have some fun, and it was edited out by the LRR crew, and um, it, it's a fun video. So if you if you haven't watched it yet, you should. Yeah, and it was really fun to do. the The guys, our, our friends at Loading Ready Run, did a great job. Uh, with the editing and filming of the video, and of course, our friends at Wizards did a great job with with putting on a fun event for the people that took uh, took part in it. Um, and it does give you a decent idea too. I, I would say that that video, while entertaining, it also could serve as a companion to this episode, just to give you an idea of what it's really like to play it. There's mm-hmm. definitely some some crazy fun stuff that happens. Now, I've got some sort of big picture points that I want to get out of the way before we dive into like mechanics and even into cards. Okay, um, sure. the first one is, so we talked about it being multiplayer. That's, you got to keep that in mind, but also let's just be realistic. You probably won't end up playing this more than once, maybe twice. Like maybe you'll stack up some boxes of it and get to play it a few times. But you know, my, my gut tells me I'll probably end up drafting this one more time when somebody says, Hey, we're having people over co- for conspiracy and I'll do it too. Cause it, it was really fun, but like, this is not going to be on magic online as a draftable set. You're not going to be able to grind this thing out. You're not going to be able to like, Oh, I've got the format solved and I'm going to be the guy that shows up and kills everybody. Cause I know exactly how to do it. Like none of that really applies to this set. It, this is a thing that you're going to get together with your friends, have a fun time opening up your box of conspiracy and drafting it. And then you're probably just going to kind of leave it behind yeah we'll see i know a lot of people are excited about you know um cracking some conspiracy to add the cards to their cube yes which is a good application of it too but you know you know if you're going to if you're going to be cracking packs you might as well get some play value out of them first yes and and that is true uh there are cards from here that you probably will be seeing over and over but as a format i expect it less now one thing that i do i will say is that uh you know, I have heard talk of people saying, well, I'm going to open up a box or two of this and I'm going to sleeve it up and I'm just going to have it around so that we can draft it again later. And sure. then, then that's a real thing. You know, that's a thing where you might actually learn it. But still, I feel like pretty confident in saying that uh, the vast majority of people will only be playing this once or twice. Um, it's multiplayer by design. We're going to keep hammering that drum. This is a very, very important. Every pick you make, every build choice you make has to be colored by the fact that it is multiplayer um yeah you're gonna have to take like 90 percent of the rules that we teach you and just throw them out the window yeah i, think. I mean i i i mean not to spoil the video but i basically killed myself <laughs> doing that i i <laughs> i i basically decked myself as a result so mm-hmm. um another thing it's meant to be fun this format is meant for fun. Now, you could say that about all magic, but that's not necessarily true. Like, while drafting is meant to be fun, it's also, you know, there's people that play magic online for money. There's people that, you know, are professional magic players and need to know these formats inside and out. And, uh, you know, they're not there just to have fun with it. They're they're there to really crack it. In this, that isn't the case. It's not a magic online. It's not going to be a real tournament format. You're not going to be playing this at a GP or at the Pro Tour. So, Keep that in mind. It's supposed to be fun. Like you're supposed to kick back a little bit here and and let loose a little and have have a little more fun with it. I think that that does color the way that we look at the cards as well. You know, you know, I have fun when I play multiplayer, Marshall. I don't know. Making sure everyone else has no fun. Oh, you're the griefer in the group. (laughs) I am the griefer. Uh, I guess you don't last that long. Uh, No, I, I fully expect to die first. Okay. Yeah, I don't mind that. Um, (laughs) uh, The last thing that I had for sort of the big overall points, these cards are not normal magic cards. They're weird. They they are not what you're used to, and they push the the limits of what you would expect to be able to happen. Uh, You know, you can watch the video to see some of the crazy stuff that happened, and we're going to be talking about it as we dive into the mechanics as well. So I'll I'll save the the examples for then, but still, like, there's some crazy stuff that goes on. Um, So why don't we start off, Brian, by Mm. talking about the namesake? Um, 
yeah, actually, can we just talk about free for all mechanics real briefly? Just oh yeah, yeah. So um, this is going to be uh, twenty life and not forty life, like you're used uh, to in good Commander, point. Mm-hmm. which is which is a, a huge difference. Um, and then it's uh, I think if you're the first player, you get to draw on your first turn. I think we did. Right? Yeah, I think that makes I sense. I can never remember how that all works. Right? Because it doesn't really make sense that you would end, but the other three players would. So I'm pretty sure you get to draw on your first turn. And then you basically, you can target anything, you attack anybody, and then last man standing wins, right? That's Yes. Yes, that's right. That's a good point to bring that up. There's none of this attacking to the left, blocking, you know, king of the star guy. What, none of that. You just It's just a free-for-all. Right. Okay. So back on track. Conspiracy cards. Yeah. So these are kind of the namesake cards. And while the set itself is called Conspiracy, it's also a new card type that they introduced. Right. Um, And this is probably the 13 cards that are not going to be legal in any format. Um, Those are probably the Conspiracy cards. That's what we're Um, thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, these are cards that uh, affect you, but you don't put them in your deck. So once you draft them... You can use them in, in your games, right? So these have, like, weird mechanics that kind of give you, like, a little bonus. Maybe you played some Vanguard magic back in the day and you're used to that kind of thing. But they, they, they give you a, a little hidden bonus. Or sometimes hidden, not so hidden. Sometimes not so hidden. So, um, like, let's see. What are some examples? Well, here. L- l- yeah. So here, I want to I wanna mention sure. th- just – in general, the conspiracy cards. So they're going to give you, like you mentioned, some type of bonus. It might be huge. It might not be. But the real thing here, and this is the part that I just could not get my head around. Well, I did, but I still had to like process it, is that they just don't fall under the normal constraints of opportunity cost. You know, Think value of a card that a normal magic card does. And the reason for that is that conspiracy cards – start in the command zone and they stay there right so they don't go in your deck meaning you never draw them they don't cost mana they are just a static think think like starting the game with an emblem Mm -hmm. right like that's another way to look at it it's an emblem like it cannot be targeted or messed with it provides you with some type of bonus and It doesn't cost anything like, you know, we've had the discussion on here quite a few times, Brian, about opportunity cost, right? Mm -hmm. The value of a card, right? And it's one of the core tenets of the show is to try to hammer home the fact that a card in your hand, even if it costs free for mana, you know, think of the Ornithopter example for that, right? Uh, New players always think their Ornithopter is great because it doesn't cost anything. So why wouldn't you play it? It's free, right? And they never realize that that's taking the place of something that could have a bigger, more profound effect on the board, even if you have to pay mana for it. Mm -hmm. These don't fall under those rules. Right. You just get them. You just (laughs) – they they're things that get to happen in the game, yet you don't have to take on any weight at all. The only thing that you have to give up – and it is significant – is it's a draft pick. Right. Th- that's the only opportunity cost because, yeah, no mana mm-hmm. cost, no no card cost. Uh, yeah, it's just if you take a conspiracy, then the card that you could have taken instead is going to be downgraded most likely to something a little bit worse that right. you have to pick up later in the draft. Um, so we should probably just give an example of a conspiracy. Yeah, why don't you do The card that. image gallery. Well, maybe um, we should – why don't we give one – um, from a hidden agenda version of conspiracy, uh, sure. like Muzio's preparations, maybe that's the exact one I was looking oh, yeah. at. Go ahead and so, read that one. So this, ha- this card has hidden agenda. So it starts the game in your, uh, command zone face down and you secretly name a card and then you can turn it up, uh, at any time and reveal the name that you have chosen. And what this does, Muzio's preparations, is each creature you control with the chosen name enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. So I I guess you're going to choose the card name before you start playing the game? That's right. So the way this actually works is you – so you draft this card, you have it, and then you have your deck and you build it. And Muzio's preparations and all your conspiracy cards, again, don't count towards your 40-card maximum. Uh, They just get to be in their own little area. And if you need to name a card before the game starts, which in this case you do, you write it down. You just write it down on a little piece of paper and you put it underneath Muzio's preparations, which, um, you know, which is face down anyway. And that is not Uh, revealed uh, until you reveal it. I'm guessing you don't have to or you don't get to draw your opening hand first. 
No. Okay. So no, no, even... it happens before the game starts. Yeah. Okay. So it's even even before you're shuffling or drawing or whatever. Okay. That that makes the most sense to me. Yeah. Um, and then you're gonna flip it up right as you're casting that that creature. So then it comes in with a plus one plus one counter. But but by not revealing it, you haven't given your opponents any information. I mean, they don't even know what what which conspiracy it is until you until you reveal it. Exactly. And so hidden agenda gets the creature a plus one plus one counter. Now the first thing that you'll realize after your brain processes the fact that this is not a card that it goes in your deck. You like I had a weird moment. So before I get to that point, I just want to say I drafted six of these. <laughs> six con- six conspiracies six or six con- muzios? Uh six conspiracies. Okay. And I I may have gone off a little bit too deep on them, but I just <laughs> couldn't I was just so excited that I got to play cards that were you know, you know one of the things that you and I like to talk about for Q Brian if you're going to play the you know five color four color deck, is that the lands that you draft are sort of like free value because right. you're playing more picks than your opponents get to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, I viewed the same thing for these conspiracies. Right, because I mean, realistically, you can only include you know twenty three, twenty four spells in your deck. Mm-hmm. So the, the, it's, you're, you're, there's like a ceiling on how many things you can take that go in your deck. So that's why we love lands, is because lands are more cards than those twenty three. You can add to your deck to make it more powerful. Um, yeah, these conspiracies kind of like re- blow that cap com- you know, completely away because. Mm-hmm. If you had, you know, you know, I don't know, you know, ten Muzio's preparations or whatever, all of a sudden your one mana one one is now one mana eleven eleven or whatever. Your deck is like, you know, virtually like unbounded power. Like that, that could be insane. Yeah, and I had six of these things, right? So, like, I was basically playing twenty nine spells in a forty card deck. You know, like that's not really how it plans out. But I had that much extra power lying around. Now, you now to be fair conspiracies you know I, I compared them to emblems they're they're like not that powerful emblems okay right? so i i guess one of my questions because we haven't seen the full set yet is um you know when you're taking conspiracies if you're drafting them highly or whatever you're going to have to play a lot of the late picks in your deck you know because mm-hmm. you're gonna have, you're, you're, if you're if you're taking these over actual cards that would go in your deck you're going to have to play probably some some lower picks did you have to play any like real clunkers or did you feel like your deck ended up okay? Uh, my deck ended up okay. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't have to play anything really terrible. I'm sure my deck could have been slightly more powerful cards wise, but I can't imagine that you could replace like the effect. So one of the points I was getting to when it comes to a card like Muzio's Preparations is each creature you control with a chosen name enters a battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. Right. Yeah. So, so you get multiple copies of that creature, yeah, which is another way to draft around it. Exactly. And that's what you want to do. So once you pick up a copy of this card, preparations, you start, you know, there's tiebreakers at play now where it's like, well, I could take my third copy of this okay creature or this slightly better creature. You take the third copy because Muzio's preparations is just going to be there. You don't have to draw it. Right. <laughs> it's so weird. You just get it for free. It's just so like. It's so I feel so free and wild and crazy when I get to play these things because it's just like there's no catch. Like after it's in your deck, there's just no catch. Yeah, from the the card image gallery, there's a couple more cards like Muzios that affect um, all of your creatures of that name. Like you can give them all haste. Right um, now, that's an interesting one because if you take, it's called immediate action. Mm-hmm. Conspiracy hidden agenda. So it has the whole thing where you have it face down and you secretly name a card before the the game. Creatures you control with a chosen name have haste. So the first one of these is quite nice. The second one is going to have to name something else. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, that makes you know, sense. And it starts to get a little bit less awesome because you are dedicating draft picks to them. And it's hard to imagine. Like, for example, let's say you have um, one copy of you know Grizzly Bears or something, right? And you're like, I'm going to take immediate action naming grizzly bears because I'd like my my one copy to have uh, haste. Uh, You know, that's not amazing. You're not exactly maximizing there, right? Now, with Muzio's Preparations, you get a counter for each copy of Muzio's Preparations you have. So it kind of does get better. But even then, you're really not pushing these hidden agenda cards until you get multiple copies of of a given creature or whatever it is. Yeah. um, The other thing I want to mention about conspiracies is that these are the ones getting the most um, buzz for people to add to their cubes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think this is probably the only, only time we're going to be talking about this type of thing. So we'll just get out of the way right now. Um, some of these conspiracies seem absolutely insane to me in cube. Um, 
Mm. Uh, there are two in particular that I, I'm really looking that I think are you know would be very high picks. Um, one of them is power play, okay. which is basically like if you draft it, you get to go first in all of your games. Uh, th- and, that could be, and it just sits there, and you just get to go first, and that's it. Yeah, especially if you're playing like a red deck or a storm deck or a deck mm. that's like you know really speed based, and you you just want to go first. Like you, you'll win a lot more games going first. Um, and another one I'm looking at, which seems absolutely insane to me, is one called Backup Plan, which is you start the game with two seven-card hands, and then you choose one of them to um, shuffle back into your deck before you do any mulligans. So it just like greatly increases the chance that your opening hand is going to be a good one. You're going to get to play a seven-card hand most likely, and probably a pretty good one. So uh, That's I, insane. Yeah, I mean, I, th- this, this is going to affect every game you play for the whole tournament you know it's like a a normal magic card you draft will affect what a third of your games how often are you even going to draw it right Right. this this card is going to affect every single game i think backup plan is probably like very first pickable that just seems like incredible um especially given that it's cube and you're going to hit playables anyway so having this the opportunity cost uh, during the draft is like a minimal hit and having it not affect the actual deck build at all is just insane yeah, some of the other ones just like um, one called Double Stroke. It's like whenever you cast an instant or sorcery of the chosen name, and this is another one of the hidden agendas, you get to copy it. Mm-hmm. So it's like you could copy Time Walk and just take two ex- additional turns, or just like just like you could make like Ancestral Recall draw six cards. Like some of <laughs> some of these things, you know, Fire Blast now deals eight damage to your opponent. Like how do you lose that game? You right. Know? Like so yeah, some of these conspiracies just seem absolutely insane to me in Cube. Um, Did you see World Knit? Yeah, yeah, WorldNet's a really fun, interesting one where um, every, yeah, so as long as you play every single card that you draft, all of your lands can tap for any color of mana. (laughs) It's just incredible. Yeah, so it's basically, you can just take the most powerful card out of every pack. You don't have to worry about colors at all. Um, And you actually, somebody was pointing out, you might actually want to draft some lands just so you can reduce the size of your deck and have the powerful cards um, show up more often. Oh, yeah, uh, good point. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think that cubes, like, have historically broken down between, like, powered and unpowered. It's like, you know, whether or not you're using Mox's Black Lotuses or not. And I think it might start to break down between powered, unpowered, and conspiracy cubes. Yeah, like, cause I, I agree. I, yeah, I, I do think choosing to have conspiracies in your, in your cube or not will, you know, drastically alter how they play. I think it will be pretty significant. Um, what I was thinking is, um, and I, I know the owner of a cube who has actually tried some of the conspiracies out already, which is it, that it feels a little bit gimmicky. So it might be a thing that you actually do, you know, half the time that we play cube, we shuffle in the conspiracies, not every single time, maybe because it, it is like pretty warping. It but is, that, yeah. Yeah. But it seems, seems like it seems fun, like some of the stuff you can do with them. So, I mean, you definitely want to like, uh, scratch that itch, you know, every now and then, but I, I don't know if you want to be conspiracying all the time. I'm just going to read another one, just not necessarily in relation to Q, but just in general, unexpected potential. It's, it's a hidden agenda. So it starts face down in your command zone and you got to name a card. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast spells with the chosen name. Yeah, that's just a fun one. So you pick that up and then you say, all right, I can splash one card for free. (laughs) It's just for free. Yeah, you can just like that's actually like really cool. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Like it's it's not even over the top powerful, but it is so cool. Like for me, this is a type of card that really is the perfect balance on these conspiracy cards because it's it's interesting. Like I had to read it twice. I'm like, wait, what? Right. And then it's just like this one card is colorless, basically, is what it says. And it right. can be cruel ultimatum. <laughs> sure. You know, well, like it's whatever you you decide it is, and you can just run it. And I just think uh, that that's the perfect balance. Like I think when we start getting up to like the big ones, like world knit, which we talked about or backup plan, it's like, okay, this is getting a little bit busted, right? Like this is, I can see that being pretty unfun to play against, like in a cube environment or even in, in the environment that it's made to be in conspiracy here. But like cards, like unexpected potential, just, just make my brain buzz and are just like, that is so cool. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm adding necropotence to my burn deck um yeah I'm, I'm putting phyrexian obliterator in my zoo deck you know like what are yes. you doing with this thing or just, you're just putting like a counter spell in a deck that nobody would ever expect it yeah right? mono white <laughs> or you know whatever right 
uh, I don't know. It seems in, like an insanely high pick, right? It, it just seems like it, it just is such a value going forward in the draft where you can just say, all right, there wasn't anything for me, but there's this crazy powerful card in another color. I can just take it without any reservations. And it's such a big deal to be able to fill in gaps that certain decks can't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like maybe you're just putting a disenchant in your Grixis deck, right? It's just sure. like there's all these different things. And I mean – I don't know how it plays out. So when you play Conspiracy, generally you're going to play a four-player multiplayer game, and it's just the game. And you can play as many times as you want, don't get me wrong, but like it's not like best out of whatever because there's four different people, so it gets too muddled if you do it that way. But you know, I could see unexpected potential outside of Conspiracy being like in between games, you're like, well, I'm going to bring in this sweet sideboard card, and I'm going to rename the card that I want or you know, for unexpected potential, you know, and you get to keep changing it. So anyway, these Conspiracy cards are very cool. The thing that I'm still trying to figure out is so I took the – controversial decision to draft these very highly Mm -hmm. um, after I realized that I could still play all my other cards. And I think it worked out pretty well. I think my deck was really sweet in that video. Um, I think I fell for the trap of probably building a deck that would have been much better heads up than in a multiplayer game. Right. Um, And that showed my inexperience with multiplayer. Um, That said, you know, I think that like, I really do feel like these conspiracies are worth pretty high picks. Uh, Some of them are first pickable for sure. Some of them are more in the middle, like maybe the Muzio's preparations or immediate action is a card that you'd want to take out of the second or third pack after you already had two copies of a certain creature or maybe even Mm -hmm. three copies of it. I had four copies of a certain creature in my list. So, you know, in that case, the card, these cards became incredible. Yeah, I, one of the things I guess I'd be worried about is, all right, it's like turn three of the game and somebody has like a little creature out and they have to decide who they attack. You know, the person who was sitting there with like eight conspiracies piled up is looking like pretty scary and attacking them, like getting them out of the game. It, it, it seems like it might make you a target is what I'm trying to it say. It made me a target. Yeah, I mean, I people... also made me a target, though. So yeah. I don't know how much was the the conspiracy cards are just me. Because <laughs> because I when, when, when I think when you play multiplayer, there's like your perceived power, and then there's your actual power, and you want your actual power to be much higher than your perceived power, right? Because right. versus, and I think some of the conspiracies might actually be the opposite. Where they don't increase your actual power that much, but they increase your perceived power by a lot because they're right. sitting there freaking people out. So I, I, I just kind of worry that they make you a target and they don't help you fight back that enough. And remember, a lot of these are face down. Right, yeah. So, so I mean, they don't it, know. Like it could be anything ridiculous, you know. Yeah, but it, it might just be like like almost nothing for you and you, you haven't even drawn the card that's going to affect. And, and, you know, it, it's it's a little lightning rod on your on your head for no reason. Yeah. All right, let's t- let's take a look at the next group of uh, of cards that we have. They're called Will of the Council. We just called them vote cards. Yeah, I think know, that's short. A little less uh, uh, <laughs> heavy. I don't know. I'm... Yeah, it is. <laughs> so they're vote cards. Um, these come in all the colors. Uh, that there's you you are going to be seeing these uh, pretty often. Uh, the one I'll read one just as, as an example, and then we'll talk about the implications of card like this. I'm going to read Tyrant's Choice. So it's one in a black for a sorcery. It's a common, and it says Will of the Council. Starting with you, each player votes for death or torture. Now each of the Will of the Council cards will have each player votes for X or Y. Right? It just Two different things. They're named whatever the flavor people decided to name them. If death gets more votes, each opponent sacrifices a creature. If torture gets more votes or the vote is tied, each opponent loses four life. All right. So you can see that these cards were designed specifically for multiplayer. Like in in a duel, they don't even make sense because they're always going to do – (laughs) <laughs> you know, the, the t- if it's tied side, right? But I kind of liked that, by the way. Like, I thought that was kind of cute that you could use them in a duel and just you know what you're getting, basically. You know at least the bottom line of what you're getting. Right. I think that's kind of cool. But yeah. anyway, that I think that's the main thing is that I think I think people are often – conditioned you know to to assume well i'm just going to get the worst of the options no matter what and that means it sucks it might it really depends on what the options are but you're always going to get something that benefits you 
from these. Like you're getting something good. Like if every opponent loses four life, you're happy. If they all have to sacrifice a creature each, you're happy. Now, you might be happier if you got the other one, but you're getting something out of these. And uh, that's kind of the interesting part. The real thing, though, is that this goes down this this path that I find confusing and weird. It's voting. I mean, you're voting with other people in the game, and everybody has their own agenda, and everybody has their own subjective views upon how things should go. And there's just no real way to control it. Like, you can barter, you know, you can talk to the other people like oh if you vote for this then i won't attack you anymore Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay great you know and for me like that i i get pretty fuzzy on that like i'm not really super interested in trying to convince people and to be shady or whatever it is but it is interesting and it makes things pretty funny when you actually play it oh yeah i'm sure there's lots of negotiation i'm sure the actual like calling for votes is going to take a lot longer because people are going to be you know um, pleading their case, trying to get you to, to vote the thing that they want, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I saw that there's, there's also cards that affect the votes. Yes. And like that a is card... a funny one. There's one called yeah. Brago's representative. It's two and a white for a one, for a human advisor. It says while voting, you get an additional vote. <laughs> and uh, interestingly enough, it says the votes can be for different choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like that. It uh, is a democratic game. Yeah, so this feels like a card that like, or I mean, just just this mechanic is going to be like, man, if you have ways to punish people, you can kind of like get leverage on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, you know, I think when I play multiplayer, I like to have, I like to have threats. I like to, um, you know, uh, speak softly to carry a big stick or whatever, right? But uh, um, just just to have ways to get people to do your bidding. So. Um, if you have like you know a loaded gun like sitting on on the battlefield, you know some card that you can just like at any time fire off at somebody's face, uh, you, you have a lot of power over that person. You can hopefully swing some of these votes in your favor. <laughs> You're a sick human, by the way. I, this, that's how I play, man. Oh and man, <laughs> I do not want to play this with you now. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> Feel scared. <laughs> <laughs> as you should be. Um, one thing I, I do, I will note is that most people will vote in their own best interest most of the time, right? They, right. They're usually going to do the thing that keeps them alive the longest or kills their biggest enemy or threat. But there is wiggle room for that stuff. So I think what you want to do when you look at Will of the Council cards is take a look at them, read them, ask yourself if the, the worst of the two abilities on average is good enough. And then proceed. Like, for example, let's just look at Tyrant's Choice, the card that we use as an example here. One in a black, either everybody loses four life or everybody sacri- or everybody else loses four life or everybody else sacrifices a creature. Now, for the most part, you would want your opponents to sack a creature. You know, unless there's like a bunch of tokens flying around or whatever. Sacking, making, you know, your opponents each sack a dude is going to be pretty good. The four life is going to range from excellent to kind of not really doing anything at all oh, i think that's that's a fifth of your life in a, in a game with lots of players i don't know I, I'd, I'd be i'd be actually scared to lose four life see I, I i view it another way because i think that what happens is like it's very rare that everybody's at a low life total because of the dynamics of multiplayer just basically say that if you go to attack somebody you now have left yourself open to be attacked as well. And Mm -hmm. you're not only leaving yourself open to one person, you're leaving yourself open to three people or maybe two if you kill somebody with that attack. And so it leads to a lot of sort of stagnant, stalemate-y type stuff. And if that's the case, then usually life totals are reasonably high. And one thing that you'll see is, so you play Tyrant's Choice, right? And they decide they all you vote for the having them sack a creature, but they're all like, hell with that. Like, we like our creatures. We're going to vote for lose for life, lose for life, lose for life. And now you just pissed everybody off because yeah, <laughs> yeah. they all just lost life. And they're like, you know what? Let's just all attack him. Yeah, that's one of the things that I found true multiplayer, which is um, whenever people can't decide who they want to attack, they just attack the person with the most life. Yes. So by kind of like knocking everyone else down a peg, you just like raise yourself up in, in, in everyone's eyes as far as being a target. So, yeah, I, I definitely could see that, you know, a card like this may have some issues. But I don't know. Both halves of that seem pretty pretty tasty to me. Yeah, and, and one other thing that I think is really cool with these is like, so let's look at this one. Loses for life, right? 
So let's say three of us are at 20 and one person's at four. Right now, <laughs> right. the voting gets really interesting because that <laughs> exactly. person's like, look, if you guys vote me out, I just die. So I have nothing – like I, anybody who sways the vote back in my favor, like if you two vote to lose a creature so that I don't die, I promise I won't attack you anymore and I will do everything I can to kill the other person. Right? And I, they're like, I, that yeah. sounds good. Yeah. I, I I hate being somebody's puppet. It's it's one of the reasons I hate playing multiplayer. It's like, it's like oh, I have this lightning bolt and you're at three life. You have to do everything I say. Like, ah. <laughs> Got to be the puppet sometimes. <laughs> no. No. I just say kill me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're never going to be Godfather. I'll tell you that. No. I, I bend knee for no man. <laughs> you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're definitely not the Godfather. You're more like uh, you're down. You're down the chain a little bit there. You're the you're the enforcer. I'm Fredo. You're not Fredo. No, you're <laughs> okay. definitely not Fredo. Um, you're more like sunny. sunny. You're yeah, sunny. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, oh, very sunny. Ben, yeah. Ben for Ben. Yeah, you're definitely sunny. Um, okay, so uh, I want to talk uh, about the next sort of bigger picture mechanic. Um, and it's along the same lines of what we were just talking about. And it goes directly in line with what you just mentioned, where people tend to attack the person with the biggest life total. Cause it like feels the least bad or whatever it is. And it's called dethrone. Mm. Yeah. I mean, p- part of that is it's like, Oh, you know, you won't take it personal. You won't feel picked on. I'm only attacking you cause you have the most life. Right. You know, and dethrone actually, directly speaks to that. So dethrone says whenever this creature, it's a creature ability. Whenever this creature attacks the player with the most life or tied for the most life, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Yeah. And I see that on some of the other ones too, you might even get an additional bonus as well. Um, yes. So that's kind of cool. Like huge, you know, huge, powerful things you might get as well. So uh, like this, the scourge of the throne, the <laughs> this mythic dragon, it looks like an absolutely insane card. But it, uh, you, in, in addition to the 1-1 one, one counter, um, if it attacks uh, the player with the most life, you also get to untap all attacking creatures and attack again. Uh, you get to do that once per turn, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can just, you can just like, almost kill somebody. Like, the first time he attacks, he's a 6-6. Six, six, the next, next time he attacks, he's a 7-7. Seven, seven. That's like 13 damage like right in your face. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the interesting part is that you get to untap all of your creatures. They get to attack again, and they can attack whatever they want. Sure. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to attack that player again. Right. I think that this is – the way I read this card is like they wanted to make a big sweet dragon. It's six mana for a 5-5 five, five flying, by the way. And so they did that. But then I think that one thing that is really cool about multiplayer that doesn't get explored a lot is that turn where you try to kill two people at once. Like I, I just mentioned that whole thing about like, okay, I'm going to attack you and kill you, but now I'm completely open. If my two opponents decide that they want to kill me, I'm dead. And this thing actually gives you the ability to be like, kill you, kill you, game. Right. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so th- the way that I play Dethrone, if I'm in the game, is like, I don't care if I have the most life. You're not attacking me. Like, <laughs> I-, I do, do take mean? it personal. I do take it personal. You're so not going to let him off the hook and by saying, yeah, but my card has Dethrone. I kind of have to attack you. You're like, no. Right. So I, I think to quote Omar <laughs> from The Wire... You come at the king, you best not miss. You best so, not miss. <laughs> so unless unless you're dealing lethal to me with that dethrone attack, you better not you better not is basically what I'm saying. Wow. You know? the, the, that is a very, very clear threat from Brian Wong. Yeah, I think I tweeted that I play uh, multiplayer like North Korea, but uh, any act of aggression <laughs> with me will be retaliated tenfold. <laughs> I can't believe that you do like this does not work. Like, all of these ideas you have are terrible. <laughs> I know. Like I said, I don't care if I win. I, I I'm gonna do it my way and I, I do not negotiate, but I do make threats and I do follow up on them. <laughs> oh my god, you are ridiculous. So, but know, yeah, but I, I will say though, from a design perspective about D Throne, I think it's really cool because multiplayer needs some nudges. Right. Like there's a reason why people invent those, you know, can only attack to the left or right or, you know, protect the kings or whatever they're called. Right. And the reason is that if you just have four people with in a in a stone free for all, the tendency is for nothing to happen. And that's bad. 
Like, you don't want the game to go on forever. You do want there to be some type of thrilling conclusion or whatever. And it feels like Dethrone is an attempt to incentivize people to to attack. And not only that, put, but to attack the person with the most life total, which kind of is the fairest, right? Like, it sound, at least that's how it appeals to most people. It's like, well, this is the fairest way to do it, is to attack the person with the most. And you don't have to feel bad about it because you're like, look, I've got a dethrone creature. It's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I think I'm I'm pretty happy that it exists. When I played the format, the dethrone creatures were largely ignored by most of us that we're playing. Uh, the ones that have an extra ability, like I'm looking at Marchesa, the Black Rose. Uh, she's one and then Grixis, so blue, black, red for a 3-3 three, three with Dethrone, the normal thing. Other creatures you control have Dethrone, which is kind of sweet. And then whenever a creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it dies, return that card to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. That's a huge ability. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you're super incentivized to start, you know, getting those dethrone counters going. Um, I think the other thing about dethrone is not just like the social aspect, but also just the the rubber banding mechanic, which is going to allow. I mean, by by making it strong against the player with the most life, it helps players catch up in the game, right? It's just like, all right, you know, that player is at the most life because you know they're doing well in the game. You need to make some mechanics to to help people beat them as well, right? You know. So I think it, it's the social aspect of it, and it's the you know actual catch up mechanic. Yeah, it's it's you know back in the NBA Jam days, it's, it's called computer assistance, right? Like it would bump the the shot percentage numbers in your in the person who was behind's favor, and if they were really behind, it would it would like skew them pretty heavily. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this isn't quite that, but it does yeah help you get back out of it. Um, so that's it for uh, oh no dethrone oh for dethrone yeah, yeah for what? dethrone, but we've got another. Uh, we've actually got we've got one more actual ability, and then I want to talk about one more. It's not really an ability, but it's something that a lot of cards have in common. Um, the next ability is called Parlay. I think it's Parley. It's Parlay. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I used the internet to pronounce it for me, and it said Parley, but I don't know. Hmm, I don't know what Parley is. I know what Parlay is. Yeah, it's like a, a meeting or something like that. I'm going to say parlay and hope that it's parlay. <laughs> um, and, and parlay basically says each player reveals the top card of his or her library for each blank card revealed this way. Something happens and then each player draws a card. So this comes in, in different forms. I'll read a couple of them. Uh, one of them is called Selvala's Charge. It's a green sorcery for four and a green. And it says parlay. Each player reveals the top card of his or her library. For each non-land card revealed this way, so there's the X is non-land card in this case, you put a 3-3 green elephant creature token onto the battlefield, then each player draws a card. So everybody draws the cards. And then anytime any non-land cards that are revealed from each player, including you, you get a 3-3 elephant. Mm, yeah, so it's, it feels like it's, it, it's like the carrot. It's like they made these powerful to get people to play them and cast them. And then um, the, the benefit of this is that with people drawing a lot more cards, you're not going to sit there like land screwed for, you know, as, as long as you otherwise would. Because that's miserable. In a multiplayer game, if you sit there and you're just stuck, you just can't do anything, like, you're not having any fun. Like, right. So I think, I think that's really the benefit of having this card, this type of card in the set is that, like, everybody's going to get to play Magic. I think so, yeah. too. And also, I, I feel like having people draw cards over and over because, like, the next card I'm going to read lets you do this repeatedly is that the game ends. At some point, because if people draw enough cards, they're going to find a way to go over the top or whatever it is that they're trying to do. And I think that's just better. Like, I think you in, in a in a set that's designed to be fun and multiplayer, I think you want people doing stuff often. Right. It's yeah, not yeah. it's not a resource denial game. It's more like how much can we give them? Right. And right. This is a way to just keep everybody loaded up on cards. Yeah, I mean, also, like, a, in, a, in a four-player game, like, a lot of actual physical time, like, passes between each of your turns. Mm-hmm. And it's really disappointing if it gets to your turn and you don't have a spell to cast. <laughs> yeah. And also it just gets boring while you're waiting for everybody else to do stuff. And now you get to like have a reveal and there's maybe somebody goes off with it and gets four elephants or maybe they get zero and you can all point and laugh at them. Um, you might get something. You get to draw a card randomly when it when in reality you're like go and you have to wait for three full people's turns to go by before you get to draw another card or do anything. Now you get to break that up a little bit. I think it's really good. 
Yeah, no, it's it's a uh, well designed mechanic for yeah. the for the format. Now, Selvala Explorer Return is the next, is the one I want to read for Parlay. That's pretty sweet. One green white for a two four legendary elf scout. Parlay tap. Each player reveals top card of his or her library. We know that for each non land card revealed this way, add green mana to your mana pool, and you gain one life. And then, of course, everybody draws the cards. Woo! <laughs> Jeez, that that can get you up in mana real fast. Yeah, if, if you watch the video that we uh, referenced before, um, BDM kind of goes off with that. Yeah, like, it's, it it's gets kinda, ugly. It's kind of funny to have a mana making ability that when you tap it, you don't know how much mana you're going to get. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So I mean, it's like I hope I can cast the spell I'm trying to cast. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of uh, funny. Uh, but yeah, that card seems ridiculous. It is ridiculous, and and I, it's also just kind of sweet. Yeah. Um, so then the last mechanic is just like draft matter stuff. Is it? You want to talk about that now? Yeah. So in and, and, and I think that that's like the draft. Like basically, what it seems like, and I don't I don't know this for sure, but I think that the colorless creatures in this set all have this weird interactions with the draft portions. Right. right. Yeah, and they wanted to make them artifact creatures or colorless cards because. They don't want it to be like, well, I can only take this if I'm playing red. You know, what fun is that? You want to have give everyone access to these, you know, crazy draft cards. Exactly. Um, and, and something I saw in one of the development articles, which is there will be exactly one card that affects the draft in each pack. Oh, so okay. It, yeah, so they, they kind of spaced it out. And that card could be a common or an uncommon or a rare. So um, you might be able to get a pack that has two rares in it because you have a rare Draft Matters card and then a rare other card. Oh, interesting. And then, yeah, and then also you could get a foil rare. You could get three rares in your pack. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. so it's like you're in the middle of a mini god pack. That'd be fun. Yeah, and and they really kind of indulged themselves here, I think. <laughs> they did some really cool stuff. Like the one that you've probably seen, and I'll read it real quick, is called Cogwork Librarian. It's four colorless for a 3-3. Three, three. This is one of the cards that they spoiled very early for Conspiracy. <clears throat> Artifact Creature Construct. You draft it face up. So that's pretty self-explanatory, but it's a little weird. You you basically have to announce it to the table. Um, as you draft a card, you may draft an additional card from that booster. If you do, you put Cogwork Librarian into that booster pack. Right. So, it, yeah, it goes and replaces that card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you kind of pick this up probably if you don't. If there's nothing super exciting in the pack for you, it's like a rain check. And then when you get that pack that comes around that actually has a bunch of stuff that you want, you actually can take two. Like that's actually like – that's really powerful. You it know, is. I, you know, I don't think you like first pick Car Librarian or anything like that. But I think what you do is is you kind of take this if if there isn't anything you're excited about. Because you know, invariably when you play a draft, there's always that pack. You're like, ah, I wish I had more. I could take more stuff out of it. Yeah, I mean, how many times have you heard people say that, right? Oh, all the time. Yeah. All the time. Now, and, and one thing to consider though with Cogwork Librarian and other cards like it – are that timing is important. You know, uh, picking the, picking one of these up in the third pack is way worse than having it in the first pack where you get to just see a lot more options along those lines. I mean, you know, you pick it up. Let's say you pick it up pack three, pick three. Like there's just not that many cards left. You might pick up a pack that has two playables for your, your colors, but you might not, right? And right. so, you know, if you can pick this up pack one, pick three, then you've got a lot of room to work with where if you do happen to open up kind of a, a great pack for you, you can snipe two cards from it instead. Um, so keep that in mind when you draft these type of cards. The, the interesting thing about Librarian is that it goes back in the pack so someone else can then take it and then the card, Librarian starts you know, working around the table again. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things that, that I was thinking about it is I don't necessarily want to use the Librarian in pack two when, it, the, when the draft is going back to the right. Um, because then that person will get it and then maybe use it on me in pack three and take a thing that I wanted. Yeah. So so I kind of want to save it. If I pick up a librarian in pack one, kind of save it for pack three when it's not going to come back and bite me That's funny. Um, in the end. But you know, ultimately, if there's two things you really really want, you're just going to cash it in. That's right. Um, um, another another one is Lore Seeker. And this is this one really does show you like how crazy <laughs> they went. It's two colorless mana for a 2-2 artifact creature construct. It's a rare... It says, reveal Lore Seeker as you draft it. So you, you pick it and you're like, hey, guys, I'm drafting Lore Seeker. And everybody's like, what? And then you say, and then it says, after you draft Lore Seeker, you may add an additional booster pack to the draft. <laughs> so you get to first pick a card out of that pack, right? Yes. Or- your ne- it says, your next pick is from that booster pack. Pass it to the player. 
I pass it to the next player, and it's drafted this draft round. Yeah, that's that's crazy. And it's you have to insane. Think of, yeah, uh, you got to think about what, what you know, what card, what pack you're going to want to add. So I mean, you know, if you're going to go do a conspiracy draft, uh, bring a couple of options with you before you go, right? Yeah, somebody has to have something laying around. If they don't, then nobody takes this. Yeah, and I assume if you're playing with this card, you know, in most environments, the the cost of the pack is going to go to the person who uses the lore seeker, right? So it's like you have to add the pack yourself. You know, it's not like, hey, buddy, like let me have your pack, right? Probably, yeah. yeah. But you get to pack one, pick one in, and I got to say, the person to the whoever you're passing to is going to be quite pleased because <laughs> they get, you know, they they just get to benefit as much as you do from it almost. While the person on the other side is pretty bummed out because the first time that they're going to see any of this extra goodness is it's going to have gone through seven hands already. Right. Yeah. This is going to be a weird card. I don't know why I'm bringing this up now, but, you know, to try to divvy up the cards at the end of the draft, like, you know, oh, know, as far as like what's worth what, who gets to take which things, you know, how do you decide that? There's two games going on. It's kind of complicated. But this lore seeker adds another wrinkle, which is like, you know, I brought this pack of future sight to the draft because I wanted to get a sprout swarm out of it, but a Tarmogoyf was opened. Like, do I have to just take Tarmogoyf because I, I don't want to pass a, you a hundred dollar card or whatever. Like, I, I, I don't know what you do. So, I mean, you got to work that out with your friends before you start playing, just in case it comes up. Yeah, I agree. Cause uh, there's often things sort of people do things the way they do them when it comes to divvying up the rares. Um, and this could definitely challenge that. Um, you know, one of the ones, and I don't see it on this list, but it, it was shown quite prominently in the uh, video, much to my dismay, <laughs> was a card that if you draft it, you get to open up the booster pack for somebody else and look at it. Oh, yeah, right. It's a little spy. Yeah, right? and yeah. Kenji did this to me. And, of course, <laughs> I had never heard of or seen anything like this. And I'm just like, wait, what? And he got – and I had to sit there and watch him to take my booster pack from me. That it was I was going to open. He got to open it up, look at it, smell it, wave it around in my face. Like the whole fun of drafting, right? Opening up booster packs and uh, and get, seeing what you got and stuff. He got to take all of that joy from me. <laughs> and uh, I got to say, like, kudos to the design team for coming up with something that vindictive and awesome. Yeah. Ultimately, it's it, it's a one man and one one. I see here, whisper gear sneak. Mm. I don't I don't really see a lot of strategic you know, worth of that card as, as like a high pick or anything like that. So it kind of does feel like a late pick as far as the draft matters cards goes. But yeah, that's a jerky thing to do to somebody. It sure is. And I mean, you do get something out of it. Like you could look at the person, you know, if you drafted it early, look at the person who's passing to you and see their pack. And then when they pass it to you, you know exactly what they took, um, which isn't a big advantage, but it does show you what colors they're in at least. Right. Um, so while we're here in the draft matters section, um, there's a little combo that I got my eye on, and as far as I can tell, it works. But it looks ridiculous to me, and this is what this is what I want to do if I, when I play conspiracy. So there's a card that was also in the draft video called Lurking Automaton, and it, when you draft it, you reveal it, and you note how many cards you've drafted this round, including it. And when you cast it, it costs five mana. It enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters, where X is the the highest number you've noted um, on Lurking Automatons. So basically, the latest pick lurking automaton you've gotten sets the power and toughness for all your lurking um, automatons. Mm. And this was the card that um, Dave Williams talk, was going, you know, first pick, first pack, to try to make this card work. Yes. Um, and here's what I want to do with it. Um, there's another Draft Matters card, it's an uncommon, called Agent of Acquisitions. And this card, you draft it face up. And then instead of drafting a card from a booster pack, you may draft... All of the cards in that booster pack, one at a time. And if you do, you turn the agent face down and you have to sit out the rest of the draft round. So as far as I can tell, because it says you draft them one at a time, I think what you can do is use your agent of acquisitions to when a pack comes around that has a, a lurking <laughs> automaton in it, be like, all right, I'm drafting this entire pack. And the 15th pick is lurking automaton. And it's a 15-15. Yeah, so now all of the lurking automatons you draft in the draft are five mana 15 15s. That's as far as cool. I can, I think that works. So they both need to be in the pack. No, so the so the agent you draft you the agent only, face up and uh -huh. then you can cash it in later. So That's it's basically cool. like if if I get an agent, I'm just going to slam the agent whenever I can 
And then, you know, maybe I don't know how late these automatons are going to go. Probably not too late because even if you get to like, you know, pick six, they're at five and six, six, which is probably good. I mean, I haven't played mm-hmm. the, the format, but I imagine that's strong. Uh, but so, you know, you know, maybe I get fourth or fifth or whatever, you know, I can just I can just cash it in right then. I have to take the rest of the pack, which may, you know, affect my deck adversely in other ways. But I all of my automatons are now five mana, 15, 15s. And then I'm gonna get that conspiracy that uh, gives them all haste and just and, kill uh, people. Yeah, just 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 Love truck, this. just truck people whenever they're tapped out. Ugh. That's genius. Now, one thing about a- agent of acquisitions, by the way, it's just it's just genius, right? Like who in there who's who who drafts even semi regularly hasn't been at the table where some guy is like. Oh, if I could just take this whole pack. Can I just take this pack? And no, you can't take the whole pack. Oh, there's so many good cards for me in this pack. I would be so happy if I Now he can just shut up and take the whole pack. Oh, I I love it. That's what this card does. This card says, "Yes, you may take the whole pack and you don't get to draft anymore for this round." Yeah, and then you'll find out if that is actually a, a useful effect or not. <laughs> right, cuz that's what the big question is always people yeah. say that and then you're like, "I don't wonder if that's even good for you." Yeah, because it may be like, you know, three or four cards you really, really, really want. Um, but then if the other 11 cards or whatever in the pack, like, you can't use it all. Like, you got to make up a lot of playables in the other yes. packs to have that work out for you. Yeah, the only time I've ever thought that was when I had a pretty solid deck already coming out of pack two. Mm-hmm. And then pack three I opened up and it was, you know, just pre- like three premium cards or four premium cards. And I'm just like, yes, would take this, you know. Right. Yeah. But yeah, agent automaton. That's that's my combo. Uh, holy cow! The only thing is that people know you have that before the game even starts because during the draft you have to reveal the automaton. Everybody knows you have fifteen mana automatons, and and they know how many you have. Uh, Still, you have fifteen fifteens <laughs> for five with haste, maybe. Yeah, I I just think. <laughs> Man, you have a huge target on your head if you yeah, pull it out. Yeah, you certainly but, do. <laughs> like I said, as North Korea, we have invented the nuke, and we're not afraid to use it. So, I mean, like, whoever comes at me first, these are coming right at you. So, <laughs> I like it. I like your plan. I like, I like to signal myself as the evil genius right away and have everybody try to take me down. All right. So, so what other let, – let's, let's just talk – we've talked about the mechanics for the most part. Sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about bigger picture. What are the things, you know, that, that we're looking to – what we're looking for, we're looking to avoid, that kind of thing? Yeah. So first of all, things that I want to avoid, things that normally I would really like in a game of limited. One that I see is a small creature that the only value it has is attacking – and I just don't want that because, I mean, you're going to do an insignificant amount of damage to your opponents. Like, you, you don't have 20 life to get through. You have 60 life to get through. Mm-hmm. And, and attacking for that one point of damage just made you an enemy when you didn't really gain much out of it. So yeah, it's you like sort of poke the bear. <laughs> yeah, it's like really actually super awkward when you're playing a multiplayer game and you're just sitting there and you have to decide who to attack. And you're like, gosh, I, I kind of don't even want to attack anybody, but that's just giving up value. Uh, so it's, I, I just think having like small attacking creatures in your deck is just not good. I, I, I really don't like that. Um, kind of in a similar vein, counter spells. I think a, a counter spell could be good to protect you, to protect yourself and protect your own stuff. But you know, if somebody's casting a dragon and you counter it, that person's really mad at you. Um, well, and, and, I, and also there's two other people that aren't down a card that exactly, exactly. So it's you. like, it's like, I am worse off. You're worse off. Those other two people, you know, they're better off. So it's like I hurt myself to hurt you. That's not really that good of a thing to do in multiplayer. Um, kind of similar to counter spells is like sorcery speed removal, because it's like you like instant speed removal. You can use it to like you know save your skin. It's like all right, you're attacking me. I'm gonna kill your thing before it hits me. Sorcery speed removal. It's like you have to be more you know you know preemptive with it um, or retaliatory either way. But it's like. You know, that thing wasn't an imminent threat. You had to use a card to kill it. Their thing's dead. You're both worse off. They're mad at you, too, to, to boot. Um, so I, I kind of just don't like that. So a- any kind of, like, clunky, slow, sorcery, targeted removal, I kind of want to avoid that. Um, just that kind of stuff. How about you? You got anything in... Well, a few in, things. A- um, one is that I want big effects. Sure. Want big global effects. That's th- Those are great. I want to be able to, you know, sweep the board or do... You know, something huge. Um, I want to try to avoid things that put a target on me. Um, Mm -hmm. I drafted a certain Planeswalker. (laughs) Right. The greatest. Uh, And 
I played him very early, and my whole game plan was around that. I had some other cards um, that helped me protect him, but it put a huge target on my back, like right away. If people are just like, you have a planeswalker, get him, you know, no matter what. Like, even if I was kind of dirtling around with it, they just, they didn't care. They just wanted to kill me. So that was bad. Um, And that makes it a little bit worse. Um, Also, uh, I learned the hard way. That the size of your library matters a lot. Oh, oh, I, I figured that for sure. Like, yeah, um, you were right then. Yeah, multiplayer games they go long. Like, it, yep. it's there's just there's no turn five wins, you know, in in conspiracy. It's it's gonna it's gonna be a grind. And like you said, like attacking opens up your own defenses. People are more inclined to kind of just sit back, not make enemies, not open themselves up. So yeah, that's gonna extend the game too. And also with um, parley, or as you say, parlay. Um, you know, you're going to be burning through your library like uh, faster than you would in a normal game too. Yeah, that happened for sure. Uh, yeah. People were – I was like, God, don't do it again. Like I've already got seven cards in my hand and like the problem <laughs> is not spells in hand. It's it's like what am I actually doing to protect myself? What am I deploying? How many threats, threats or answers or whatever can I deploy in a timely fashion? And I just didn't want any more cards and uh, I just watched my library dwindle. Yeah. Um, so, uh, stuff that I like, um, evasive threats, like, oh, if, yeah, yeah, flying. I mean, you figure the ground is going to be, is going to be, cl- you know, cluttered with stuff. So I think any kind of evasion or land walk, um, especially uh, for a couple reasons, like one is like, those things are going to be able to attack, you know, way more than any kind of ground thing. Um, another thing is just having it is like, is more threatening. Cause it's like, if you have the flyer and they don't. They don't want to make you mad because they can't stop you from attacking them. Um, so it, it's it's good to threaten people with that. Um, uh, I mean, also I want to have ways to stop their you know their flying right. So I don't have my own flyers to block them because I, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be sitting around in a game where three people have flyers and I don't because I'm going to be the one getting picked on there. Yeah, you know, so I I, I don't want to be showing up to that to that fight um, without flyers. Um, I want to have like ways to dissuade people from attacking me. So like maybe like, you know, I want my early creatures maybe just to block just to stave off the early points of damage. But then um, I want to have like instant speed removal, you know, like here's this source of plowshares in my hand. Like I'll show it to you guys. Like <laughs> any dragons coming at me are dying. Like, <laughs> like I, I don't care if it's a surprise or not. Like I just want to be able to say like, yeah, you know, stay off my lawn. Um, I, I want, like in 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 theme for you in this yeah. setting as well. Like I like I said, I'm North Korea, right? It's like you're not allowed to come here, or whatever. Like, um, I talk a big game or whatever, and I and I back it up. Um, but uh, like punitive effects, like any type of like you know tap to deal damage to you. It's like all right, you hit me, I hit you right back. You know, just stuff that's gonna be like make people not want to attack you. Um, and I think um, you were talking about how like the deck size mattered a lot more than you thought. So I was thinking um, it might be it might be good to have some milling effects actually here because uh, you can t- you can might be able to take somebody out with them. I, I think that could be pretty powerful. Yeah, and and I like the ability to like I really like threats that allow you to target somebody without opening yourself up to being attacked. Like mm-hmm. let's say you have some big dragon and you're like, well, I want to try to kill that guy. So you're like, I can attack you, but now you can get attacked, right? Where if you've got you know, some mill sp- mill card, you know, let's just say millstone or whatever, like some, you know, permanent that mills, you can just be like mill you, but I can still leave up all of my blockers. And that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah. So I, I think my, my early creatures, I just want them to be blockers. I, I don't, I don't want early aggression because like I said, you don't want to make enemies. So I want my early creatures to block, you know, hopefully well throughout the game, maybe stuff with reach. Or stuff with the big toughness, maybe that kind of thing, just to get me through. So I'm not an early target, you know, help prevent that. But then going on, I just want once I've you know, you know, kind of gotten to the late game, I just want big, powerful effects. And I think instants are really good. Like instants seem really good to me in multiplayer. Yeah, they're very flexible um, in multiplayer, even more so than regular, because you can also use them as leverage politically. You know, you can be like, yeah, look, exactly. I'll save your guy. But right. you owe me, you know, that kind of thing, which, uh, like I said, d- doesn't super appeal to me, but, like, it's kind of fun. And uh, and you'll certainly see that kind of stuff happen all the time. Another thing that I, I really like in in multiplayer is mana. Like, I like the ability to produce tons of mana. That is one of the ways that you can dominate 
uh, multiplayer game is by just powering out a bunch of early mana so that you have stuff that's just much bigger. I mean, you might make enemies, but if you have a lot more mana than your opponent, you can also just kill people. You know, mm-hmm. we, we saw BDM use that, uh, that legendary elf to play like a five drop and a seven drop on the same turn, something like that. It was just yeah. like, whoa, you know, all of a sudden he just powered out like Palaka worm plus something else. And it was like, <laughs> geez. And he, you know, kind of hung out, but like, if he really wanted, he could have killed any of us individually and probably not died himself, uh, yeah. on that same turn. So, you know, that's a, like having ramp, having big mana ramp is a big deal. And, uh, I think that, you know, if the mana fixing is good in the set, that that's something you should pay attention to as well. Just because if the game's going to go long, I'd love to be three colors. Like if I feel like, oh, it's going to go long enough that I'm going to hit my different colors of mana, I would love to be able to branch out and have a more powerful deck by by playing three colors. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking is um, like very situational effects might be a little bit easier to use than they would be in a duel because – you know, in a duel, you know, that game can go by fast. The situation might never come up. It might not be good against your opponent. But in a game with a lot of players, probably going to come up. Um, yeah, that's true. So just looking at the spoiler here, I see, like, Decimate. And it's a sorcery. It kills an, it kills an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a land. Now, that, that's a, actually a very difficult card to even resolve in a duel. Because you're basically, you need to have your opponent have an artifact and an enchantment and a creature and a land. Um, some of those are easy. But artifact plus enchantment, that, that might never come up. But... Man, you figure, like, every time you draw Decimate, there's going to be four things out there that you want to kill in a, in a multiplayer game. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think those could be good. Um, I don't know. Do you, like, do you, what's, what's your mindset going into the game of Conspiracy? Like, are you just trying to, like, keep a low profile? Like, are you are you trying to be like, I'm the guy, don't mess with me? Like, like what's your own personal philosophy? Well, so there's, I have two answers to that because uh, after having played it, I, I changed it. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my original philosophy was pretty in line with yours where I'm just like, I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to try to kill people and I'm not going to care. And if you guys kill me, then so be it. That's, and I'm just going to try to just sort of run it. Um, but that didn't work. <laughs> that that just got me killed, basically. And uh, th- what I've seen, if you want to win these four-player games, is to always be the person who looks the weakest and then can swing their their presence from the weakest to the strongest in the in the shortest amount of time. Um, you know, we saw Kenji play favorable wins times two with no creatures and miss a land drop (laughs) and brick on a spell. And, you know, it was like he just wasn't doing anything. So nobody really paid much attention to him. And then a few turns later, he had three or four flyers that were all getting plus two plus two. And it was like, whoa, like now he can just kill like he could just kill anybody. You know, he ended up killing me on one turn. He killed BDM later. Right. And it's just like he but but we could have killed him at any point like he was completely had no permanence, nothing going on. And we're just like, yeah, go, you know, right. And like, uh, yeah, you, you got nothing. We'll deal with you later. We'll deal yeah. with you later. Like your deck clearly didn't come together. You've got two favorable ones with no <laughs> flying creatures, you know, and it turns out he had like 14 of them. And, you know, he was, his draw was a little clunky. He did actually naturally miss land drops, but as, as, as it goes in multiplayer, it went long and, and he found the lands and then he started deploying threats. And all of a sudden his threats were much bigger and better than anything we were doing. And he was able to take over. Um, and so, you know, for me, I want to be in that seat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, w- I want to be the person who's overlooked and just sort of, oh, he's just sort of putzing around over there. And then, boom, all of a sudden, you know, I am assert myself and I've got like this sweet board state and you've got stuff that you need to deal with. And maybe it's too late. Right. Or maybe other people were scrapping it out and they're both at five and seven and 13 and I'm at 20. And now all of a sudden I can start just like in one attack, I can kill a person, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, so I, I think my best advice is, you know, it, when you're, you know, you, when your friends call you up to play conspiracy, do, do people still call each other anymore? Like, I, I don't remember no, the last that's time what I text messages are for. Yeah, I, I'm like an, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't know how it works. OK, but, but, but anyways, your friends invite you to play conspiracy and you're like, conspiracy what's that I've, I've never heard of that they're like oh it's like multiplayer draft like oh that sounds cool tell me more uh you know little do they know like you're like 300 pages deep in your conspiracy manifesto that you're secretly writing you know so nobody knows that you've studied the whole spoiler and yeah. you know all the combos and all that stuff but you know but you just you want to you want to play the fool right you, you don't want anybody to know 
that you're like, you know, uh, you know the, the evil genius, you know, lurking. So, yeah, I think like while you're playing the early turns, you're like eating, you know, you're dipping your chips in like the nacho cheese and you spill some on your library. Like, oops, you know, let me wipe that off you know, with your shirt, <laughs> you know, and like, you know, like you're not really paying attention. You're like, oh, is basketball on? What's going on over here? You know, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like turn, you know, 12 and you play your two combo pieces and you kill everybody. Right. Like th- that's how you win. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love I this deep strategy advice from Brian Wong. I think that's the mindset you want. Now, like me being me, unfortunately, I cannot use that because I have just recorded a podcast about conspiracy. Nobody's going to believe me when I say that I haven't looked at the spoiler uh, or I don't know what it's, what's going on. So that's, that's why I have to be North Korea, which is I sit down at the table and I say, everybody, the first person to take any action against me, any attack, any destruction, anything is going to be my solitary target for the rest of the game. Who wants to be that person? Because <laughs> so I say, I, I, I may lose, but I guarantee that you will not win. So, so what you're saying is that in order to be a godfather, you have to, you have to act like Fredo. But you don't <laughs> have it in you, so you're just going to be Sonny. Like I said, and like, we know how that ends. Spoiler like I alert. like I said, like I'm me. How am I gonna how am I gonna play like I don't know what's going on? You know, like people are gonna no, try I to agree. kill me first anyways. If 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 I know people if, if I know people are coming at me, then you know, I, I, I gotta lay down the electric fence, you know, and let people know you you don't cross it, you know? So All right. So that's la- how I'm doing it. Laying down the electric fence with Brian Wong. All right. And, uh, <laughs> and you know what happens when you do that in a multiplayer game? No. Uh basically uh all three other people say, all right, we have to team up and kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, just, they just hate you. <laughs> right. And they kind of build up. And then when one person gets strong, that person like is going to be the first person to attack me or whatever. That's okay. I stick to my guns. You know? Right. That's okay. We know. <laughs> um, right. So uh, d- concerns about conspiracy. Like I, I know like, you know, we're like super spiky players. Um, maybe this product wasn't exactly invented for us. Do you have any types of concerns that like might – might make it so you don't draft conspiracy at 50 times. Um, not really. I mean, the, the, only, the only reason why I wouldn't is because I'd rather draft a, a quotes real format, right? Like, I mean, I, I like to, to break out and have some fun sometimes, and I would draft this again for sure. It was really fun. Uh, I, I can honestly say that. But, like, this isn't the type of thing that I'd want to, you know, put in my 10th conspiracy draft on, I don't think. Like I think it would it would wear thin. I don't really like multiplayer. I would play it more as an exception rather than the rule. So you know maybe longevity is a little bit of a concern. I don't really think that it was designed for longevity in mind though. So I'm not really worried about it. I, I just feel like for me, you know, it'll probably have a fairly quick short uh, shelf life, and then I'll kind of be done with it. Yeah, I kind of feel that same way for me. Um, I mean, one, it's just kind of like it could be a challenge to get you know, together eight people that want to play it. Yeah, um, I, I guess it's recommended. They they said six to eight, and they think that like maybe six players breaking into two three player games could work. Um, you know, I, I can see that. Um, but yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to get that many players together for a draft when it's so much easier just to fire up Magic Online and I got a queue in five seconds. Right. Um, the other thing for me that I, that is a big issue for me is when I play multiplayer games, I don't like the kingmaker aspect, and basically the. The definition of kingmaker in a game is when um, the winner of the game is determined by the losers of the game. So it's like the third place player will frequently have a decision where it's like, if I do this, then this player wins. And if I do this, this other player wins. And it's like, I, I know that I can't win, but I can, aff- I can affect, still affect the outcome of the game, which is kind of awkward. Mm. Um, so it's like to, to kind of spell out like a very basic example. It's like, let's say there's three players, A, B, and C. Um, Player A has a dragon and they have 20 life. Player B has a dragon and they have 20 life. And player C has five life, which would die to either dragon, and they have a kill spell. And it's like a sorcery, right? And it's like, well, you're not going to not cast the thing because casting it will increase your chance of living, right? It's like, so you're going to cast it, but whoever's dragon you kill is going to be at a huge disadvantage in the game. So it's kind of like you help to determine the outcome of the game when you're probably still dead anyways. And I like just that aspect of games can be very frustrating because, you know, if, if I'm player A or player B and I have a dragon and you kill my dragon and now I lose and you're dead anyways, like that's frustrating for me because I like to control my own fate. You know, I, I like to, right. I like to feel like the decisions that I made made me win or lose. And I hate the fact that like, 
you know, just third party out here is like affecting who wins or loses. That that bothers me. Yeah, that that's another reason why I think the the shelf life is short for me on these is that I I don't like I would really be playing conspiracy for fun. Like I I don't care who wins that because like anybody can just decide to screw you over anytime they want. Like there's just not a lot of accountability. You know, it's just not really about that. Yeah. Another thing is um spiky players. Um, it can be very competitive and emotions can run high. And this is true for probably all magic players as well. But, um, you know, after I, you know, make a, a peace treaty with you and then attack you next turn, um, are you going to be mad at me after the game or not? I mean, I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, are, are you going to invite me next time you're going to dinner or, or, or not? Because I backstabbed you. Like, no, so. and, and that is the thing though. Like people really don't like that. You know, know, they, they do get angry. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, and that's just like. I just could care less, you know, about all that stuff. Like, I'm just like, whatever, like do it, do what you want to do. Yeah. 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 For me, it's, it's all about posturing. Um, oh, I guess I had one more strategy tip and this is something that I learned from the show survivor, Mm -hmm. but, and basically survivor actually is is really similar to like a multiplayer free for all game. It's like you vote people off and in kind of in multiplayer magic, you're attacking people off, right? It's like that person is a threat. We're going to kill them. Right. Um, and it's if you're playing a game with a lot of leaders, a lot of people like making strategy and you know trying to pull strings and be in charge. If you're playing a game with lots of those people, you kind of want just want to be quiet and kind of sit back and be more passive. And they'll kind of overlook you as they try to like yes. you know fight with the other people. But if you're playing a game where everyone is passive, then you want to be the solitary leader because then all the deals that you make will be more effective. And you'll be actually be able able to sway people and swing games. So it's like you want to go again. You, you want you want to do the opposite of what everyone else in the game is doing. It's kind of like like I said, if there's lots of leaders, be passive. If everyone's passive, be a leader. Like th- that's kind of like my, my my social advice for playing multiplayer magic. Good. So that's right. fun. I will say that it is fun. If you want to just have a good time with your friends, invite them over with a box of this and draft it, you will have fun. It is crazy. And there's some really insane cards in here that haven't been spoiled yet that you'll, you'll have to wait and see, but, uh, they are really cool. And, uh, the designers did not pull back. (laughs) They they did not hold back much with this set. Uh, they, they made a lot of funny, cool things happen. Uh, you know, the one I go back to is that agent of acquisitions, right? Like, Everybody that's drafted has had that experience, that that guy that's like, I just wish I could have this whole pack. And they're like, here you go, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm really looking forward to that backfiring and them realizing that it was a huge mistake. Um, th- that would be really fun to right. see that. Happen. It's just so meta, right? Like it's yeah. only like drafters get this, right? Because it, yeah. otherwise it's just like, I don't really know why would you want that or whatever. So, yeah. all right. So uh, why don't we move towards the old wrap up here, Brian, unless you had anything else that you wanted to uh, add on before we do so. Uh, no, that's it for conspiracy. I just want to say that I did a couple streams last weekend. So if you ah. want to check them out, yeah, you go to um, twitch.tv slash Brian Wong's evil twin and you can uh, check out some of my, my drafts. Awesome. Yeah, I have the link for that on lrcast.com on the front page also if that's easier. Um, they're archived too, right? Yes, you can watch my, my past drafts. Um, you know, I always tell people, like, if you got something else going on, go do that thing. You don't have to watch me live because you can always catch up on it later. Yeah, which is a nice feature for Twitch. That's cool. Um, I'll have to check up on those. I was gone while you did that. Um, Right. So if you guys want to send us any feedback via email, you can do so. LR at LRcast.com. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, my name is Marshall underscore LR and Brian's is Brian underscore LR. If you want to join the Limited Resources clan on Magic Online, just send me a message, Marshall underscore LR. The only rules are that you have to love magic and you cannot be a jerk. I'll get you an invite. If you meet that criteria, very easy to do. Last but not least, for everything limited resources, including Brian's stream, you can also find the blog section that has all of our crack packs in it, plus other random stuff. Everything's there, lrcast.com. Guys, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Oh, hello, Marshall. It's good to see you again. Thanks for coming down to Watsi headquarters. Did you drive or ride your motorcycle? I drove. Okay, okay, good, good. Um, I guess I should explain... You know, get, just get to business, but why we wanted to see you in person. You see, we're promoting a brand new Planeswalker, oh, Dak God. Faden. <laughs> and the marketing team has come up with a few ideas, and we want to hear you test read them before we green light one to use in coverage. Um, do you have the copy of notes that we prepared for you? Uh, I have a little of it here, yeah. Okay, then let's get started. Could you please read the first one for me? Uh, Dak Faden is the greatest thief in the multiverse. 
Uh, let me stop you right there, Marshall. Um, if you read that one five times an hour, people are going to think that you are a massive tool. Uh, you'll never hear the end of it. So let's try number two. And for this one, I want you to think Monster Truck Rally. All right. Faden, Faden, Faden. Come see Dak Faden this Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Not bad, but I don't think it really explains what's going on. Um, let's try number three. Uh, if it walks like a Dak and quacks like a Dak, it's probably Dak Faden. And he's good at stealing stuff, I guess. All right. Whoever wrote that one, <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> don't come in on Monday. Uh <laughs> All right, for number four, I want you to think fierce. Dak Faden. Women want to be him. <laughs> Women well, want to be start, with start him. Start over. Start, start, start that one over. Gather yourself. Fierce, Marshall. Fierce. <sighs> Dak Faden. Women want to be with him. Men want to be with him. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. I feel That's like not this, bad. this copy isn't great. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame the copy, Marshall. It's on the delivery. All right. So um, how about you want, you want to give number five a try? Uh, it just says acapella changed the lyrics of Duke of Earl to Dak Faden. Yeah, I guess that's not really that. Uh, clear. So <laughs> maybe it would help if I, if I, did, if I went first and then you, you copied me. Okay, you do that. Dak, 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 Dak Faden, 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 as I walk through this world, Dak Faden, nothing can stop, Dak, Dak Faden, Dak Faden, and you, Dak Faden, you are my girl, Dak Faden, and nothing can hurt you, Dak Faden, oh no, Dak Faden, I quit.